These are some of the best tools and skills that you can have in the industry. If you are able to speak on any of these terms, you're going to number one, be able to work with investors. Number two, you're going to be able to impress people. I don't care how new you are in the industry. If you understand this, it's going to land and it's going to come really well. This is also fantastic for objection handling because a lot of the time when people go think of like, oh, this is too expensive. I can't afford it. All these obstacles they'll put in their way mentally. If you understand the workaround for them, you're going to alleviate some of their biggest fears. The three things we're going to be touching on are the IRS 121 exclusion, the Prop 19, and the 1031 exchange. I'm going to try to simplify these down to a very simple basis, and we'll take it from there. I know that this is going to be a tedious presentation. You guys probably can sit there right now and think like, this is going to be long, kind of boring. Try to bear with me on this, because if you understand these concepts, it's going to help you so much. Before we get into the IRS 120 exclusion or the 1031 exchange, first and foremost, we need to understand what capital gains are. What is a capital gain? When you sell an asset for more than its basis, aka what you paid for it, all the additional income is a capital gain. And my example on here is this. Susie bought a ring for $10. Susie sold the ring for $15. Susie made $5 of capital gains. Now, Uncle Sam wants us cut, right? That's where capital gains taxes come in. Basically, the money you made is your capital gains. After receiving a capital gain, you're going to be taxed, uh, both on the state and federal limit. Usually, it's around 34%. Now, I said the, ca the rate of capital gain is going to be based on the income level. Basically, what I mean by that, and not to over bog you down, is some people can offset capital gains with losses on their taxes. Let's say they sell something for less or lose money in some venture. They can balance it around. General rule of thumb, 34% of all the money that you make for profit on something is going to the government. An example of that, Susie bought that ring for $10 and she sells it for $15. Susie has a $5 cap gain. Susie has her original $10 and $5 of capital gains. Now Susie owes the government $2 of the newly earned $5. So even though she sold it for $15, Susie's only able to keep $12. Bought it for 10, sold it for 15, pockets, actually pockets $13. Sorry about that. But we're talking really rough math here. The IRS 121 exclusion. When selling your principal residence, if it's owner occupied two of the previous five years. And what I mean by that, hey, I've lived in the home for eight years. That applies. Hey, I lived in the home and I moved out one year ago. Well, you've lived in it for the last five years. That applies. Hey, I lived in the home and I moved out two years ago. That still applies, but you're starting to get to the very tail end of it. Those are people that are owner occupied for two of the previous five years. A single person would be able to get a capital gains tax-free of $250,000. A married couple would make $500,000 of capital gains tax-free. An example of that, Joe, a single man, bought a home for $500,000 and lived in there seven years. So he's he's lived in it two of the last five years. Joe sold his home for $800,000. So $300,000 in capital gains. The IRS 121 exclusion allows Joe to set aside $250,000 of his taxable income. Joe owes capital gains on the unprotected $50,000. So if Joe was married... Joe and his spouse sold the home for $800,000. They would have $500,000 of capital gains tax free. So that $300,000 they made in capital gains, they get to keep all of it. That's the IRS 121 exclusion, specifically for principal residences, owner occupied principal residences. So if you own your home and you live in it, you don't have to necessarily pay all the profits on capital gains. Who does this pertain to? Sellers who are worried about taking a capital gains hit when they're selling their property. This is a huge thing. People say, well, I lived in it, I made a lot of money, but man, I'm going to owe the government a ton. Well, let's think about that. You you bought it for a million. You put 100,000 into it. Your basis is 1.1. 1 .1. Um, if we sold it for you know 1.8, you get that 500,000 capital gains tax free. That puts you at 1.6. You're only paying capital gains taxes on the remaining 200,000. 
which is really going to work out to be about $64,000. So you're going to be able to walk away from the whole transaction for 1.8 less the 64 grand. That all of a sudden alleviates all their fears because a lot of time they're assuming, hey, I'm going to pay 34% of the whole entire 1.8. No, you're only paying the 34% at the very end. If you're able to clearly explain that to somebody during that process, it's a huge hurdle over an obstacle. Sellers who moved out of their property within the last three years, I am going to ring the bell and call the alert for all of our investment partners here. Pay attention to this. Anyone who participated in any sort of investment partner activity, if you hire a property management lead that previously owned the pro lived in the property and owned it and have turned it into a rental, a golden opportunity is going to be for you to reach out to them after one year or two years of renting and say, hey, guys, your IRS 121 exclusion window is closing. I just want you to be aware of that where you as a married couple could sell your property for $500,000 in excess of what you you're, you purchased it for, your basis is, and you could keep all that profit. Because after you've not lived in the property for two of the last five years, and it's been a rental for, for too long, that's gone out the window. This opportunity has closed. It's no longer your principal residence. So red alert to anybody that's hiring or, or finding property management leads. If they owner occupied it, Mark that on your calendar to reach out to them and tell them about that 121 exclusion that's going to be, you know, whittling away. Or if they're considering selling the property now versus renting it, that's another great thing to talk about. Hey, well, if you turn it into a rental, sure, you could make monthly income, but keep in mind, you made all that money right now and the government won't take it. 1031 Exchange is a real estate tool that allows investors to swap from one investment to another and defer capital gain gains. Essentially, you're able to take the equity from one cup and pour it into another cup, and you're not going to be penalized for that, paying, paying the government on the money you made. The 1031 Exchange was created to incentivize landlords to continue to be landlords and continue to keep their money in the market and house people. An example of that. Jim sells a rental property he originally purchased for $100,000 for $500,000. If Joe does, goes to sell it and decided to keep the proceeds, he would have capital gains on the $400,000. And that we're talking about 34%. So he's approximately paying 130 grand on capital gains taxes. If, if my, is my math right on that? Somewhere in that general vicinity. Instead, Joe does a 1031 exchange and moves his $500,000 of equity from one property into a new investment property for $500,000. Joe doesn't owe the government anything. He's basically exchanged the equity from one into another. This is hugely advantageous for anybody that wants to, let's say, cash out of a single family home and move it into a better cash flowing asset, anything along those lines. Or Buy an investment property that's going to also turn into a retirement home down the road or a second home by the beach. I mean, these are a really useful tool to use. Exchange. Now let me tell you about boot. Boot is basically the money that's left over if you your exchange doesn't match numbers. The original property sale price exceeds the cost of the newly acquired property. It's called boot. And an example of that, Joe bought that property for 100000 and sold it for 500000 Jim did a 1031 exchange to avoid capital gains taxes, but the property he ended up purchasing went for 400000 So he had 500 in this cup and he poured 400 into the next cup and the remaining 100 grand he was going to keep in his pocket. That 100 grand is boot and that is subject to capital gains expenses. So 34 grand to the federal government and the state government. Key things to know in a 1031 exchange, it needs to be like kind. Like kind is terminology that you're going to hear used thrown around quite a bit. In order to do a 1031 exchange, you must exchange into a similar type property. And it must be a rental into, simply put, must be a rental into a rental. Now, there are some outside forces on that, but just to keep it simple for yourself, just buy a rental into a rental. You could sell a single family home and buy a multifamily. You can sell a multifamily and buy a single family home. You could sell a commercial property and buy a residential property. That's not the concern. The concern is that you rent it out. It was a rental beforehand and the new one is also a rental. 
1031 exchanges can only be income properties. Owner-occupied properties do not apply. And in order to fulfill the 1031 exchange, you must keep and hold the newly acquired property and use it for its intended rental purpose for two years. Now, this rule is not black and white. And what I mean by that is intention. So the federal government is not going to say, you didn't have it for two years when you had a change in life circumstance and had to sell it to pay for X, Y, Z. Uh, I'm going to tax you on it. That's not exactly how that works. Definitely defer to an accountant on that because everyone's going to be different. The intention is that you own it for two years and keep it as a rental. You can exchange into a property that's more expensive, but you have to pay the difference yourself. An example of that, uh, you sell a $100,000 rental and exchange it into a $120,000 rental. That's fine. No capital gains. You just have to pay that 20 grand difference out of pocket and or with a loan. There can be boot implications if mortgage numbers and equity spent aren't done correctly. So make sure to consult with a 1031 exchange company before doing offers to ensure there's no boot. Long and the short of it, guys, you are a realtor. Your job is to sell houses. It's fantastic to know these general tools, but do not confuse yourself as a certified CPA or a, a tax preparer. You have to generally understand them and then connect them with an expert that knows these things through and through. But with the general understanding is always good. Along in the short of it, always consult with an expert. Always tell people to talk to their accountant. Always talk to the 1031 exchange intermediary in between. Independent third party. So while doing a 1031 exchange, you, you never actually take possession of the proceeds of the original sale. Basically, there's a, always a third party that takes the funds from the original sale and gives it uh, on the, your behalf to the next purchase. That's called an intermediary. Now, a realtor is not an intermediary. Your title company is not the intermediary. There are 1031 exchange companies where you literally hire them to take in the funds and be the intermediary and fund the next purchase. Typically, 1031 exchanges are reasonably affordable. Think a thousand bucks, maybe 2000 bucks. They're, they can get more complicated in a reverse 1031 exchange. Don't worry about any of that right now. I don't wanna over bog you down. Timeline for a 1031 exchange. From the close of escrow of your original property. So Daniel here just sold or put listed his house property for sale. We're not counting any timeline yet. He's accepted an offer. No timelines are getting counted yet. Property closes. Boom. The shot clock has started. Daniel has 45 days from the sale of the original property to name three targets of your 1031 exchange. Meaning he tells the 1031 exchange company, I want to buy 123 Main Street, 124 Main Street, or 125 Main Street. Those are my three targets. He has 180 days from the close of escrow of his original property to purchase one of those three targets. Now, in all practical terms, if I do, I do usually about five to eight uh, 1031 exchanges a year. The moment I list their property for sale, I'm immediately going and looking for new homes. And ideally, I want to have something in escrow immediately. I mean, like, prior to the close of the original one, just so I have a backup thing in place now, or at least know what my targets are. You can shop up into the deadline, but just understand people who get caught waiting to the very end, they end up having to buy something that they don't want to purchase because their timeline's running out and they don't want to give the government all that money. Reverse 1031 exchange. This is going to be super complicated. It's almost impossible to do with a loan. And, and for, for all intents and purposes, it is impossible to do with a loan. So it's pretty much only for cash buyers. My suggestion is to avoid this at all costs. Don't go suggesting this out to people because it's going to be very, very complicated. You can do the entire things backwards. You purchase the new replacement property and have 180 days to close your original property. So you still need to use the 1031 exchange company or the third party, third party intermediary. You need to identify your intentions of the reverse 1031 exchange on the original purchase. So you basically say, buyer is going to be completing a 1031 exchange on that document. It's more expensive to complete a reverse 1031 exchange 
oftentimes costing five thousand up to ten thousand dollars to do that reverse exchange and it's more complicated with the holding of title and ownership because remember you never actually hold both properties titles at once in an exchange so theoretically the intermediary would create an entity that owns the new property originally when you purchase it and when you sold the old ones they'd swap the funds etc not all lenders participate in a reverse 1031 exchange it makes it incredibly complicated i've had some avid serial investors that get absolutely stumped by this so don't don't proposition this as like hey we should just do a reverse exchange because it's pretty complicated how does it apply to you as an agent with this 1031 exchange sellers who have a single family home and buy better cash flowing multifamily i can't tell you how great this is guys especially those of you who are doing the investment partner stuff hey sue bob I know you own that home, that single family home, and it's a rental right now, and you've owned it for a long time, but it's only making you two grand a month. And if we sell that thing and buy uh, a similarly priced fourplex, we might be able to triple your monthly cash flow. That kind of conversation and explaining to them what a 1031 exchange does immediately thinks, well, I don't even go buy that house that I own. You guys manage it. It's I'm just collecting the checks. I would love to collect a check that's three times as much every month, right? Those are the conversations that start to train them to become investors. Investors, if you're dealing with an investor, they probably already know about the 1031 exchange anyway. So you better know it too. They will quiz you on it. They will want to make sure you're comfortable with it. It's a good thing if you're going to be dealing with investors to have an understanding of this. And inheritors who want a 1031 exchange into a vacation rental. And this is what I mean when I said vacation rental. I live in an area that's very popular for second homes. And I have seen multiple times people buy an investment property. They sell their fourplex in wherever, and they come by an investment property that happens to be a single family home right next to the beach. And they either vacation rent it out or rent it out for two years with their full intention of coming and retiring there or using it as a second home in the future. So that's a great avenue for somebody that wants to trade their equity and not pay capital gains taxes on the sale of their original property. Say, well, if you 1031 exchange it and rent it out for two years, you don't have to pay taxes on that. So good little tool for you to keep in mind. Prop 19. When I wrote this, I think I was being a little bit exagger exaggerating a little bit, but uh, Prop 19, the death of generational wealth in California real estate. I, uh, you, can, you can see how I feel about this. Prop 13 was a thing where if you purchase a property at your tax basis, you would keep it at that tax basis. If you left it to your heirs, they would keep it at that tax basis in generations and generations and generations. So hypothetically, if your grandparents bought a house in Silicon Valley for $10,000 when it was still a farmland, and now that property was worth $5 million because it's right in downtown San Jose, you're still, you were still originally paying the property taxes on $10,000, what they originally purchased it for. Crop 19, which was started a few years ago, eliminates that. So basically, at the death and re-inheritance of a property, properties now get reassessed, and their original tax basis no longer applies. So an example of this before Prop 19, our great granddad bought a lake house in 1940 for $20,000. His descendants paid taxes on the $20,000 uh, 20, purchase price with mild increases in perpetuity. So probably around 1500 bucks a month, right? Or a year annually. So it was costing them almost nothing. Now, a new example with Prop 19, granddad bought that lake house for 20,000 upon his death. It was appraised at 10 million, super desirable lake house, right guys? Now his family gets to fork over 110 grand annually. So it went from $1,500 to $110,000 because that got reassessed under Prop 19. Now, this doesn't apply for all properties. Owner occupied to owner occupied up to a million dollars still can do Prop 13, meaning that if you know, your parents bought a home for 500,000 and they decease and leave it to you and you, they lived in it full time and you live in it and it's only assessed at 500,000 or under a million, you can keep that original payment structure. 
But for the most part, any sort of secondary homes, any sort of investment properties, all that will get reassessed upon death now. Transferring tax basis, uh, the more applicable part to real estate sales. Allows seniors, so Prop 19 was two parts. Not only was it reassessment, it also had some perks built into it. All seniors, anyone disabled, and those affected by natural fires and disasters got to transfer their tax basis to a new property. And I'll give you an example of that. 80-year-old Joe has a tax basis of 100000 and sells his home for 500000 He purchases a new home closer to his grandchildren for 500000 Joe can keep his original tax basis of 100000 as long as it's in California, California to California. This is a state thing. Um, or different example, somebody will, let's say all the people that were affected by the Paradise Fires, they got to keep their original tax basis when purchasing a new property because they were displaced by uh, natural wire, wildfires. Now, this is super relevant to those of us that deal with elderly people looking to downsize. And one of their biggest obstacles might be, well, I can't afford the new taxes on this new house. Prop 19 protects them. Prop 19 basically is there to protect the downsizing elderly and keep their original tax basis in place. What happens if you buy a home that's more expensive? You can still transfer the prorated amount of your tax basis in a home that exceeds the sales price of your original property. You just need to pay the difference. And what I mean by that is this. Amy has a tax basis of 100,000 and sells her home for 500,000. She purchases a new home in California for 650. Amy gets to keep her original $100,000 tax basis on the 500, first $500,000 of the purchase, basically, and worth of her new, the new equity in her new home. But she pays the current tax rate on the remaining 150 of that balance. How does this apply to you? Inheritors now face huge annual taxes. Property taxes are going to be spiking for everybody that inherits properties that's not owner-occupied to owner-occupied. With that said, though, the tax basis goes up upon time of death. So the new tax basis means there's more property tax, but the new tax basis also means that there's no capital gains tax at the time of sale. Austin, what's up? You're talking about, say, the, the 500000 Is that basically the tax basis is off the sales price and not the assessed value? Is that what that is? So back to this original thing where this uh, senior citizen sold it for five hundred thousand. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would be that would be their assessed value because they've already sold the property. So it, as long as it was an arm's length transaction, then yes. As long as and now if they sold it to their daughter for one dollar, there's no way the IRS and the, the state franchise tax board is going to go for that. But as long as it's an arm's length transaction, basically, it's the difference of sales price. Back over to this point, though, if someone inherits a property now, they can sell it right now with basically no penalty from the time of death. They can sell it and not be hit with major tax implications. Prop 19 was put on the ballot, guys, by the California Association of Realtors. I want that to sink in with you a little bit. The reason the California Association of Realtors fought to put this on there was to force people to sell their homes when they inherit them. So... Put yourself in a position to, it, it's a horrible law. I hate it. I hate everything about it, but it's the new rules of the game. So you really need to be able to play that. So when you meet somebody that's just inherited a home, you need to talk to them about, hey, your new tax basis of the home does mean that you will pay higher property taxes on the property than what your parents are paying for it. But you are able to sell this home now and not and keep the profits without having to pay for the federal government. It's also hugely important to the elderly community that are downsizing because they're able to transfer their tax basis with them if they go into a smaller home or a different home or move closer to the grandkids or whatever. And people who have lived in their current property for a long time and fear the consequences of moving, this is super important for them. Understanding the different laws, regulations around Prop 19 and what their tax basis will be. This is going to be my summary of all these things, the Prop 19, the IRS 121 exclusion, and 1031 exchange. This is how it works. Now go verify with your accountant. I want to stress this. You are not a tax expert. You just know how this works. 
So don't get yourself sued because you have so many bad information. It's important to have a loose understanding of these terms. The better you, your understanding, the better it is. But always have them verify with an expert. Always defer to the expert. You're not an accountant. You can explain the terms to the best of your ability, but they should verify all the information with somebody that knows this and does this professionally. And even in emails to them, it's never seen as a bad thing to tell somebody to go verify it with their accountant because it's a transparency. It's a level of transparency. Hey, you need to verify this with the person that's preparing your taxes. Sending links and sources to potential clients can be helpful. Bringing these options to their attention and pointing them in the right direction to gain more knowledge is all it takes. All we're here to do is understand these basic information points and then be able to let people know about them as a, a hurdle to their obstacles. Okay, that was the overall run through. Do I have, do you guys, anyone have any specific questions on this, on any of the terms? All right, Daniel, what's up? So if you go back to the first one where you said they paid $20,000 for it, and then now it's worth 10 million and they owed 120 something thousand, right? Couldn't yeah. they just take a home equity loan out to, to pay for that? For sure. So home equity loan could absolutely work. In this scenario, though, in, in this scenario, that person had deceased and his heirs now received it. So the heirs would now have to pay the new property taxes on that $10 million. Now, if they were comfortable taking out a home equity line and eating into the equity to maintain that property, they absolutely could. To pay that annual property taxes, that is always an option to take more debt on the property. But keep in mind that debt is going to come with a cost in addition to the the increased cap gain or the property taxes. So it's a really a, kind of a gut check decision for them. Is it worth me paying one hundred and ten thousand dollars or whatever some extravagant number in property taxes, and paying the interest on that home equity line for me to maintain that property or is it more suitable for me to sell the property and use those funds elsewhere? No one has to do anything, right? You just want to arm them with information to make the best decision for themselves. But yes, you can also tell them about home equity lines. Not a horrible idea. Debt is good too. <laughs> the exclusion. Do you have to purchase another home? No. Okay. So you can just cash out. You can cash out and go become a renter. doesn't matter at all. That's, okay. that's your money. You can... You can YOLO it all in Vegas that afternoon. doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want with it. March Madness. Or on uh, the capital gains percentage that is taxed. Is there a website we can go find to see like what the different brackets are for different amounts that you'll have to pay or? State and federal. I want to I want to say a uh, total is like 34%. But if you just do a quick Google, uh, cap gains rate, federal rate, cap gains, state of California rate, it'll tell you. And it comes it's, up. I believe, it's 30, 33 and one third, 20% on the federal, 13 and a third on the state. So if your capital gains is five or 50,000, and then your capital gains on another property is 5 million, is it the same percentage taking out of each dollar amount? Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. Now, when I was saying it doesn't, it matters it, on on your income level and everything is some people can offset capital gains with losses. So let's say somebody is holding a property and they're claim or something, some asset, and they're losing hundreds of thousands of dollars on it per year or writing off. They can offset those cap gains on loss years and basically offset that. But yeah, you're going to, they're going to be hit 34% cap gains. And that applies to all things, not just real estate. So in theory, if you sold your car for a massive profit, you would technically owe cap gains on that. If you sold a fine piece of art for a massive profit, cap gains on that as well. Actually, I have, I have a question on the uh, 31 exchange, the 1031 yeah. exchange there. So if it's an investment property exchange for another investment property, if you say rent out your house for two months, would that then qualify as an investment property, even though it's only two months? Your own personal residence? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Say it's your own personal residence. In theory, and again, this is going to be go talk to your accountant. Okay. I don't know how familiar you guys are with accountants and, and tax law and everything like that. Taxes are not black and white. They're very gray. 
Some accountants are super conservative. Some are super aggressive. They're the ones that are finally stamping off and saying, yeah, this is how much this person owes and sending it to the IRS and praying you they don't get audited um, and have to go support that amount. Some accountants probably would sign off on that. Others probably would not. But my question back to you is, is the 1031 exchange a better avenue than the IRS 121 exclusion, which is typically built for your owner occupied? Um, that's a personal question based on your own personal situation. Oh, I don't know. That, that, that's, just a, that's just a question for you. Ethan, Ethan, that'll come down to how you claimed in the past. So technically you could live in a residence, but still claim it as a rental property on your on your past year's taxes. So it's gonna it's gonna ultimately depend on what you claimed in the past is what's gonna really determine that. So if you're claiming it as a personal residence, you can't just go do 1031 because that's gonna that's gonna be a red flag immediately. You're getting audited for sure. But if the past three years you had it as a rental property on your taxes and you did a schedule E every year, it'll fly every time. Okay. Does everyone have a general understanding on how this is applicable to you out there in the field and interfacing with clients? It's really good tools to have, guys. And, and I highly encourage you, if you don't understand these three terms, just do a quick Google search. Uh, however it is that you like to process information, I'm probably not the world's best teacher going on a slideshow. I'm sure that there's animated videos or clear and concise write-ups or anything like that. They're really good tools to put in your tool bag. 